Welcome to episode four of the ACC History Series, the story of the Asian Community Center Nursing Home. I'm Jean Shiyamoto, the board chair of ACC Senior Services and the moderator for today's presentation. Before we introduce our guests, I want to remind our viewers of the two organizations that laid the foundation for ACC in the early 70s. They were Asian Community Services, or ACS, and the Japanese Community Center, also known as JCC. So ACS was founded in 1969 by activists that included students and faculty from Sacramento State University, UC Davis, and Sacramento City College. These people included Harold Fong, Margaret Fujita, Raymond Lee, Andy Noguchi, June Oto, Peggy Saika, Earl Shiroi, Randy Shor, Hach Yashimura, Lily Yi, and many, many more. They provided the blueprint for what would become ACC's lifelong learning and wellness programs. So separately, JCC was founded in 1972 by a broad community group organized by Leo Goto, who worked at the Sacramento Housing Redevelopment Agency to study the feasibility of establishing a Japanese cultural center. The focus of this project was housing and health care for elderly Japanese. But nothing would have materialized until the ACC nursing home was built 15 years later in 1985. The JCC and ACS collaborated on many projects until they formally combined forces in 1973. And in 1979, JCC changed its name to the Asian Community Center. So episodes two and three cover the history of ACS and JCC, and you can find these on ACC's YouTube channel or our history page at accsv.org slash history. So now I'm going to introduce the panelists, our distinguished guests. We have a great lineup today, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves, and we're going to start with Donna Yi. Hi, I'm Donna Yi. I'm the past CEO at ACC. And I was the CEO from about 2000 to 2017. And I now make jams and am happily retired. <laughs> I'm Gloria Imagiri. I've been a board member forever. And I guess <laughs> my claim to fame is that I've been around for a long time. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Brian Chin. I was a board member during the development of the nursing home back in the uh, 80s. Um, I did return to the board in 2006 and termed out in 2011 and currently I'm the board president of the Meals on Wheels by ACC. And I'm May Lee and I uh, joined uh, then it was called JCC which then became ACC <laughs> and I was hired by Chewy in 1976 as the first paid uh, coordinator to develop a lot of the senior and the services and the programs. So um, that's what I was doing then. Well, great. Thank you for all being here uh, today. And so if you look back on ACC's 50-year history, you really notice how certain themes emerge. One, community activism. Two, community services. Three, housing. And four, the collaboration between the Chinese and Japanese communities. So this collaboration continued all the way through the development of the nursing home. So would you all agree with this observation? So you guys need to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> would you agree with that, that this collaboration really led to, I've heard a lot about where uh, the Japanese and Chinese communities really came together because families were going to school together, churches together, and really they collaborated on this idea of the nursing home. I think because uh, for many of us and our parents' generation, the Chinese and Japanese really stayed separate. And in those days, there were even fewer Koreans, Vietnamese, Hmong. There were almost no Hmong, Min or Bao living in the Sacramento area. Uh, so it was really, I think, when people started to work together in the same place and, and were forced because of redevelopment to live in the same neighborhoods, mm -hmm. that people started to at least get to know each other. Yeah, because I was uh, in getting ready for this. People talked about the redevelopment that was occurring, occurring downtown, which forced a lot of folks to start looking elsewhere and look at housing for seniors. So now we're going to discuss the evolution of the nursing home idea. So the idea of housing for the alley goes back to the founding year of ACC, then knows 
and known as JCC in 1972. So Gloria, your sister Peggy, Psyche was involved in ACS and JCC from the very start, and she conducted a very important study in 1972 that identified key needs of the Japanese American community. So you want to discuss what those points were? Well, the main focus was on housing and health care for the Issei, and it took Peggy eight months to complete the study and develop a proposal for meeting the needs of the elderly in the Japanese community. And uh, when you talk about redevelopment, at that time, uh, many families had uh, moved out of the downtown area, but there was still a sizable uh, population of East State around the Southside Park area. Um, and JCC envisioned a high-rise complex in downtown Sacramento with 80 to 100 units. And even though each unit was to have a kitchen, there was going to be a central dining hall serving at least two Japanese-style meals a day. And the primary funding source for the project was going to be the Federal Housing Administration. So uh, according to the report <clears throat> from Tegi, it also proposed a health care facility that was attached to housing for people. And from the report, you know, I, I quote a statement, not able to care for themselves, but not ill enough to warrant convalescent care. So this report really foresaw the future of ACC. But unfortunately, JCC had to abandon this idea in 1974 and would take another decade for ACC to refocus on housing and health care. So, so you want to talk about what happened? Brian, you want to comment on that? Uh, well, what happened was uh, President Nixon's administration uh, declared a moratorium on funding uh, many services, uh, including housing projects. Personally, I was affected by his cut of public health funds back then. How, how so? You just Well, I was planning to uh, uh, attend graduate school at Berkeley in the public health department. Mm. Uh, but I was also dependent on uh, 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 winning a scholarship. And so the uh, moratorium eliminated scholarships oh. for public health students. OK. So, um, so then you ended up coming to Sacramento after that? Oh, no, no. I was already in Sacramento. Oh, okay, okay. I, I was here in the 70s, uh, early 70s. And so that was coming from San Francisco, uh, where, as Donna has mentioned, the Japanese community and Chinese community did not intermingle. Uh, so coming up here to Sacramento and to find that the, the two communities were working together at JCC and ACC was very attractive to me. Okay. So with housing on the back burner, what was ACC doing between 1974 and 1980? So May, you want to comment on that for us? Well, already when ACS uh, transitioned and uh, turned their services, their, their senior recreational uh, programs um, uh, over to JCC to, to pursue and go ahead. That's what ACC was evolving into, uh, concentrating on, on, on doing that. And, and uh, with some of the services or programs, uh, it was led by uh, Kenji Morishige. Uh, he thought about working with the Japanese nutrition uh, care and so he he went and pursued that, and that was a program under uh, JCC ACC at the time, a nutrition program, and that inspired the the Chinese uh, community that had a housing project right across uh, uh, on Broadway and A, mm -hmm. and they said, oh. Well, since they're doing a Tano Shimi Kai, uh, let's do something for our Chinese oh, okay. elderly and, and at that time. And then along with that, uh, a, a, ACC was uh, really pursuing uh, assisting already student-led, like George and uh, King Hong Law students, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and help them with their Asian Legal Services outreach uh, also. And, all, and uh, there was the Palham Clinic, medical students coming from uh, Dr. Lindsay Kubagai's UC Med Center. Mm -hmm. uh, they formed the, the 
well, now we know it as the Paul Hom Saturday Clinic. And so those were programs, and then the summer youth program was started, and, and then later on when I finished my um, uh, college degree uh, in social work, I, I then took on the Asian resources, which was employment mm -hmm, and training. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so all these things were, were, were uh, percolating or being launched, and, and another one was Health for All which was actually started, preventive health care for families. So, uh, and Stepping Stones, which later became Asian Community uh, Pacific Counseling Center. Okay. And so, uh, all these things for mental health. So, so, ACC was pretty busy, but then they were going back and saying, well, um, uh, since we've launched all these other programs, what, uh, I think we should stay back and revisit what our mission is. And our mission and our goal is to continue to pursue this idea of, you know, efforts to maybe nursing home, but along with all the senior other programs. Yeah. So there was a lot of different activities going on, startup mm -hmm. of other um, mm -hmm. nonprofits, general organizations, mm -hmm. uh, which we might do a program later on to talk more about those. Mm -hmm. uh, but then again, we focus back on uh, elderly care and Mm -hmm. and the nursing home. But you guys, any thoughts on what May talked about? Any comments? Well, actually, in, in the uh, 70s, in the 60s, under the Great Society, a lot of programs were starting in a lot of local communities. And the Asian Pacific Islander community wasn't very organized. So it really wasn't until later on in the next generation of programs that they called model cities that people started to get organized and think more about how these public programs could benefit the Asian and Pacific Islander community. Uh, so in, in the early 70s, many programs like uh, Kero Senior, uh, the nursing home in Los Angeles started uh, the one in Seattle started, also called Kero. They mm -hmm. formed a nursing home. Um, there were groups that were starting uh, housing programs. Um, let's see, in Boston, South Cove started around that time. Uh, housing programs were getting started, but it was, it was very slow because in, in those times, most of the mainstream nonprofits or the large organized uh, church organizations were sponsoring these programs. So it really wasn't until later in the 70s uh, when money was available that independent standalone groups like ACC started thinking that there was an opportunity uh, to compete and get funding for large projects. Oh, okay. So uh, one of the things that, um, uh, listening to you talk, May, mm -hmm. is that the, um, after launching, launching these organizations, mm -hmm. the ACC board made a decisive move in its mission for senior programs and services mm -hmm. that ACC would rely on community support right. rather than government grants to fund the organization. Mm -hmm. And that's when ACC started a membership drive and the beginning efforts toward the nursing home. So this is really where uh, what it, we see of ACC today is a mm -hmm. community supported organization and it started back then mm -hmm. and it still con continues because we have a, a large base of donors um, that very generously donate to ACC and a large base of volunteers oh, that yeah. that really support ACC and really helps us on our fundraising our events and things like that so that community grassroots effort still resonates today that was back uh, when things started when all those organizations were getting started mm -hmm. Okay, so we can see from, an old, from old issues of ACC News that <clears throat> money and, and the lack of it was openly discussed. So this front page article from July 1980 is titled, Will ACC Close? <laughs> it says that ACC fell short of its $25,000 goal. The staff and board members would initiate steps to expand the organization. So ACC almost went out of business but right across from it, you can see that ACC is calling a community meeting to explore elderly housing. So ACC still pushed ahead. They held a meeting on July 22nd, 1980 at the Nisei VFW Hall on 5th Street and it was an open forum for people to bring their ideas uh, and thoughts. And so what is everybody's perspectives on this? 
Any, any discussion on, on ACC almost closing and then still pursuing housing? Well, I think in, in those days, of course, even today, most families want to be able to take care of their elder parents. And oftentimes when they need help uh, getting in and out of bed, they need assistance because of their health or their disabilities. Um, I think more people in the community started to see that uh, it would be helpful to have a place where that additional help could be provided that families no longer could. So I, I think from the very beginning, people in our community saw um, things like nursing homes or senior housing as extensions of what families were doing, you know, not to displace them. Uh, because many of the families were still, especially in Sacramento, they were still intact. It's not that the children were moving off to some other city mm -hmm. and weren't physically available to provide some care. But I think more and more as people were working, they found that they really, uh, really couldn't handle 24-7 care that, that a parent might need. Um, especially if they had to work and take care of their own children. So, you know, the timing was, was good mm -hmm. because the city of Sacramento took a renewed interest in affordable housing. So June Oto, representing ACC, participated in a citizens committee to make recommendations to the city of Sacramento to address housing shortage issues. And Donna, generally speaking, what was going on in the country at that time to develop affordable housing and what were Asian communities concerned about and what were they doing? So there was a big push and pull. Uh, in those years still, uh, I used to uh, work at a home health agency and I used to get questions from people who were uh, Caucasian about, uh, you know, did, uh, did I know, did I, did I, uh, they didn't realize that when they went to the hospital, if they had to share a room, that it was possible that the other person in the room was not white. Mm -hmm. uh, so Asian, the, in the Asian community, we had a push and pull. On the one hand, we were frequently told, you know, you guys should take care of your own. And on the other hand, we were told that if we got public money, we had to serve everyone in the community. So even, uh, you know, if, you know, since the, the civil rights era started, it was still going on in the 70s and 80s. People were still realizing in their everyday lives uh, how that really affected them. Um, and a lot depended on, you know, when uh, the Republicans were in, they were trying to tear down all of the parties that the Democrat, uh, all, of, all of the policies mm. that the Democrats had established. Uh, there were many uh, uh, struggles trying to tear apart the housing and urban development and defund subsidized housing mm -hmm. programs, saying, you know, tax dollars shouldn't be spent on that. It should all be private sector. Uh, one of the beauties of, um, like, the senior housing program uh, is that the government would help fund the construction uh, and then enable you to pay off the loan through um, operations, but they would also subsidize rents so that people with very low incomes could afford to live in those apartments. Um, and in, in those days, um, it was very difficult because it depended on uh, how much money, like today, uh, the Congress uh, authorized uh, to, be, to be spent. So you could compete for the money, but it didn't mean you would get a project. Yeah, it's true. It's true, very competitive. Mm -hmm. So um, in the 1980s, the Citizens Committee, uh, June Oto was, uh, was on, presented findings to the city, and uh, the ACC board and staff began in earnest to research Sacramento's housing market for the Asian elderly Asians. But, but this is when there was a shift at ACC of housing to nursing home, uh, you know, concentrating on the nursing home. So Donna, can you explain the difference between what might have caused the shift to go to the nursing home idea for ACC? Well, I think um, in those days, there were two levels of nursing home care. 
there was one level for people who really needed uh, a lot of care because they had disabilities and they really needed skilled nursing every day. There was another level of care that they called intermediate care, uh, where people were much more ambulatory and they also called it convalescent care. Mm -hmm. So even in the reports that uh, Peggy and the group wrote, they talked about convalescent care mm -hmm. uh, and they talked about housing. So the difference between the two is, um, you know, uh, uh, is not that clear. Uh, on the one hand, in a nursing home, especially if it was intermediate care, uh, people were still able to get around by themselves, but oftentimes they needed help. And people who were in senior housing were able to live on their own. And maybe a nurse or, or somebody would come in and help them with some of their housekeeping or their care, but that might only be one day a week or two days a week. Uh, so I think in the community, people uh, weren't able to say, we have 200 people needing this care and 300 people needing that care. I think people were very concerned about the fact that uh, they had relatives and they had friends whose parents and their parents uh, really needed more help and during the day, during the work day, and the adult children weren't always able to manage. Uh, so I think the shift from thinking about housing, which was being defunded, uh, to looking more towards uh, the possibility of a licensed health facility, a nursing home, uh, started to come about. Uh, the funding is very different. Mm -hmm. uh, the funding for nursing homes was more um, uh, located in the state, not mm -hmm. with the federal yeah. government. Mm -hmm. Uh, both projects took many years to develop, uh, but I think that um, uh, because um, people like Bob Matsui started to be very politically active and was in his early years of being an elected official, he was able to, uh, together with people like Leo Goto, who were involved as professionals and technicians in that infrastructure of how government money was made available to communities, all of that uh, became uh, more available and the ACC board was able to talk about it as real possibilities. Yeah, I think we're very fortunate to have Bob Matsui and other elected officials uh, among us who understand the politics and how to navigate through that and really keep us informed of, of what to be ready for and how to prepare for that. So uh, one of this is, uh, uh, in fact, you know, Gloria interviewed two people who talked about the need for uh, skilled care. And uh, we're going to have a video of Jan Morikawa talking about this. And this is Gloria having a nice chat with, with Jan. So uh, let's watch this video. I was trying to, you know, I've known you because you were my sister's classmate, and I, I knew who your grandmother was because she worked at the cannery with my mother. But um, I was trying to think back on when we first got involved, when you first got involved with ACC. I think it was when I got involved was, was when we were first thinking of doing the nursing home, and uh, there was a a community forum or community meeting and that's where I first went to um, to the meeting and that's how I got involved my grandmother was very um, needed a lot of care and my parents had retired and they were having a hard time you know taking care of her and she was really somebody that was very social and so it was difficult for everybody around the other my uncles and aunts would help out, but I thought, gee, it would be good if she could go someplace that um, that she could be taken care of, but they would also have, you know, activities and things. So I started looking around for places, and I went to several places, and they didn't have hardly any Asians or anything, and so it got me depressed. And then, then I heard that ACC was starting this, so that you guys were looking for somebody people to be on the community advisory board. So I, I asked, said I would, you know, be on the advisory board. And, uh, and that's where it all started, my involvement. Um, you were there, and Chewy, of course, and 
um, the staff from from ACC and and it kind of all got started right from the very beginning there for, for the nursing home. So Gloria, this was a, a great interview with Jan. And uh, what do you think about what Jan said? You know, I think a lot resonated with you. It resonated a lot with me in terms of what she said and the, and the need. Jan was like a lot of Asian family caregivers at that time. In her case, it was her grandmother who needed care but the available facilities didn't meet her, her needs because she didn't speak uh, English and the facilities did not serve the kinds of food she was familiar with. Mm -hmm. And they all gravitated towards ACC because our group seemed to be the answer to what they were <laughs> looking for for their loved ones. Yeah. I, I guess it was obvious that skilled nursing was the Asian community's greatest unmet healthcare need. And Jan saw that ACC was working to fill that need she joined the ACC board, and she became one of our leaders, a great great one, right? Right, and she yeah. served many terms. I yeah, mean, yeah, she yeah. was uh, serving on the board even in 2000. So, yeah, yeah I, I watched the whole interview, and uh, there was an event she attended, and you saw her, grabbed onto her and one of her friends, and looped her into ACC, and she's been with ACC for, for all that time now, and still taking oh, yeah, some classes. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. Well, it was at the Sumitomo Bank, you know, their conference room or whatever, and I saw uh, Francis Oda and uh, Jan, and we said, those two seem really interested, and we said, oh, gosh, we've got to get them involved, and they did become involved. Well, I, I kind of comment when we were discussing this, that, that that's the ACC MO, is that we see somebody that's enthusiastic, and we're just going to grab you <laughs> grab and, <them. laughs> and, and make you become part of the ACC family. Yeah. Uh, so, Gloria, you also interviewed Helen Kwong, and she talked about a lot of things. But in particular, she told a story that really changed her life and her relationship with ACC. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about, about Helen and Dale Kwong? Well, for years, Helen her, and her husband, Dale, used to play Santa Claus and his elf while visiting children. Well, the reason I say children, because it was not just people in the nursing homes. Okay. I guess they went to children's homes and things, you know, and, she, and during the holidays. But she said it was every holiday. So I think they went Easter in different times, took them different things. And Ka Helen was a cashier at Jumbo Market. I don't know if you remember her. And Dale was in produce and groceries. And they would bring apples, oranges, and she mentioned socks, because that's what they really wanted for the people they visited. So, you know, you mentioned Helen Kwong, and, and I knew Helen Kwong when she worked at the cashier at Jumbo, because I would take my mom grocery shopping there. And she was so sweet to my mom all the time. But I never knew this side of Helen, that this oh. is what she was. All these years I've known her, yeah. and she was always so nice to my mom when I take her grocery shopping. So. Uh, in this next video, Helen Kwan explains what happened on one of her visits. So let's watch this. And we'd walk into the nursing home and they all lit up. People would smile and they'd be so happy. Well, Dale's job was to greet all the patients and, and I would give them each a bag. Of, what was in the bag it was the, the gift. So I walked towards the kitchen, we were almost through and I saw somebody sitting in a chair in the kitchen, and it happened to be a little Japanese lady. I walked up to her, and I said, Merry Christmas, and she looked at me and just kept showing me a bowl, a little saucer, and she looked so sad, and she kept showing me this saucer. It had cottage cheese in it, and I I thought to myself, why is she holding this bowl with the cottage cheese? And I thought, you know something? She wants rice, not cottage cheese. I, I know they would never eat cottage cheese. That was something they never got used to. And this poor little lady, I know she just wanted cottage cheese. Well, I found out from the lady that was in charge that this Little lady did it every day. After lunch, after dinner, she sit there, stare at this bowl of white cottage cheese. So that picture of that little lady stayed in my mind and heart for years. Gloria. Oh, I think people of her, well, we're of the same generation, Helen and I, and I think we felt the same about 
you know, these people with these unmet needs. And so we naturally found a common cause at ACC. And in 2015, Chewy Ito was interviewed by Amy Vong from ACC and said that Helen came to him with her story about Asians being isolated in nursing homes. And Chewy said Helen asked him to do something about it. <laughs> so, so, so what do you think? So then this is where I think everybody says Chewy just sprung into action. <laughs> <laughs> and we've heard lots of stories about Chewy doing this, but your thoughts on that? Anybody want to comment on that? Well, uh, Chewie did spring into action, <laughs> and he led the uh, ACC board to make a um, consequential decision to explore, back then what we call convalescent care services. Uh, ACC made this a, a high priority project for the 1981-82 fiscal year, and uh, things got kind of serious because uh, ACC considered buying a 121 bed nursing home located somewhere in the south area of Sacramento. I can't tell you uh, exactly where. But uh, excitement was building. Uh, I personally got hooked into the nursing home idea because my late father-in-law was in a nursing home, but it was your typical Medica Medi-Cal type nursing home, and definitely there was no rice. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and there was always your, the recognizable fragrance when you walk into the building. Mm -hmm. So that's what attracted me to staying with ACC to develop the nursing home uh, uh, concept. Now, um, people were so excited, they had, we had heard about Kiro. So we invited uh, uh, Edwin Hiroto, uh, who was the administrator of Kiro Nursing Home in Los Angeles, to come up to Sacramento to not only speak to us about the Kiro concept, uh, but we also he also joined us in the uh, inspection of that 121 bed nursing home. And after the tour, uh, we had we got together, as you can see by the uh, uh, picture of me with uh, Mr. Hiro Hiroto, uh, to talk about the possibility of a nursing home in Sacramento uh, by ACC, and he also gave us his commentary on the 121-bed uh, facility. In conclusion, he was, felt that we had a good project going, and he encouraged us to keep moving ahead. So that was really uh, an important meeting, having him come up, and that's a great picture of you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I was young once. <laughs> I also wanted to comment that in that picture with Ed Hiroto was uh, Yvonne Lee. And she at that time worked for Social Security. So I think ACC was always, to me, strategic or like Gloria said, finding the right people and grabbing them to be on the boards and things like that. So, so if you have the right skill set, you're, you're definitely going to be a part of, we're going to get you in here somehow, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. use that knowledge. But we benefit from the knowledge in terms of, we learn how to operate and how to get, get through some of the, the problems we need to get through in the issues. So, um, so right around this time, structural engineer Jimmy Yi who later became Sacramento City Council member, mayor of Sacramento, and a Sacramento County supervisor, was just getting into community services. So Donna Yee and Judy Keene interviewed Jimmy Yee along with Phil Eisenberg. Uh, Phil is former mayor of Sacramento and state assembly member. And we'll hear from Phil later in the program. But let's listen to Jimmy Yee talk about how he got introduced to the ACC family. Because it was Bob Matsui who first came to talk to me about getting oh, really? involved. Right. Bob and I are very close because uh, we went to the same social activities that he belonged to the 2030 Club. Uh -huh. And eventually he became our oh. company counsel, legal counsel. Uh -huh. So wow. I knew Bob pretty well. And uh, he's the one that got me involved into this, this project, which is so-called nursing home. Huh. And at that time, were you mainly uh, doing engineering? Were you involved in politics at that time? Uh, not in politics, no. That, that's the furthest from my mind. So when Bob came to you, it was partly because of your professional skills as an engineer and partly because 
you're a leader in the community? Well, I appreciate those comments. <laughs> but, uh, I was just starting to get into community affairs. And, uh, uh -huh. you know, when you start in a business, you only have so much time. But right. he's the one that got me interested in that uh, being more active in the community. Was it a hard sell? No, not the hard sell. You know, Bob <laughs> Sui, he can talk you into doing anything. <laughs> what were some of the, um, uh, you've mentioned all these people that were involved. What were some of the first steps that you, as a, as, I guess, an informal group? I don't know. How formal was the group? Uh, the way I looked at it, it was informal sort of all the way <laughs> because uh -huh. we had no established organization. Okay. And like you say, Chewy was very active and he got his own group together. And right. Eventually, Bob reached out to myself and the Chinese community. Uh -huh. And I think, you know, the, looking back, the nursing home and his predecessors was the one thing that got the Japanese community and the Chinese community together uh -huh. because our elders weren't seen eye to eye because of the war. Oh, and we can understand that. Yeah. But we're the jung younger generation, you know, we get to know each other a lot more on a social basis. Uh -huh. and, so. and, all the, and all the kids and the grandkids were intermarrying uh, and not paying any attention to their elders. That's um, right. Yes, so that helped too. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So Donna, you want to comment and talk about Jimmy's, co Jimmy's contribution to ACC? <laughs> You know, Jimmy is somebody who doesn't go around bragging about what he does. Uh, but anyone who has worked with Jimmy and needed some help, especially after he became an elected official, know how generous Jimmy has always mm -hmm. been. Uh, so whether it's not being sure why the building department didn't give you a permit or whether they were giving you a hard time, uh, not like they were giving everybody else a hard time, uh, whether you were being fairly treated. Uh, you know, people went to him with their uh, home, uh, ho uh, home and property situations, but certainly over all the years, uh, even today, ACC has gone to Jimmy uh, when we've needed help with uh, city departments and permit processes county departments and permit <laughs> processes because they're very different. Uh, I think also uh, getting the word out and uh, seeking his counsel. So we've always been lucky uh, to have Jimmy as an advocate, even though maybe it's not like he stands at the front door and greets people <laughs> every day, uh, but he certainly has always been a staunch supporter and friend of ACC's. He definitely has a really, uh, you hear different things about Jimmy, but he quietly does it behind the scenes. He doesn't take a lot of credit for it, but he's been a great uh, supporter of ACC over the years. So, Brian, you want to talk about Phil Eisenberg? Uh, well, you know, Phil it was a gentleman to the left of uh, Jimmy in that earlier video. Uh, Phil was the, uh, we could call him Phil. Uh, <laughs> he was that kind of a guy. Uh, Phil Eisenberg was the mayor of Sacramento from 1975 to 1982. And then, like uh, so many of his uh, successors on the city council, um, he moved on to become an assemblyman of the state legislature. Um, in regards to ACC, you know, I saw him many times at ACC fundraisers. Uh, he followed, he supported, and attended many, many ACC fundraising events, and uh, he was he even served as the master of ceremony at our art auction. So, uh, so by now, uh, listening to everybody talk about this, ACC board was all in on the idea of a nursing home and decided to go with a design from Vitello and Nia that was used in previous projects. So. Uh, Donna or Gloria, do you want to comment on um, why their design was, was appropriate for us? Well, um, they had done um, a nursing home, that, that firm, and it was up in Paradise. And I remember going up there. I think now after the fire, that place probably burnt to the ground. But anyway, it was this odd 
star-shaped kind of, I, when I first saw it, I thought, wow, what a funny but design, but it fit on that piece of land we have. So I think that's probably why we ended up with that. I think the other thing is that since it was a design that had gone through all of the re review processes of the state with yeah. Oshpod, yeah. Um, the it, it clearly uh, would, would be much faster to develop uh, than if we had a, a spe specially designed building. Uh, I think the other thing that's great about the design of the nursing home is it has a hub and spoke pattern which very few nursing homes mm -hmm. have. So that from any hallway uh, in, in the building, you can see the nurses station. And the nurses 24-7 uh, uh, could always hear what was going on in the hallways and throughout the building. So it really uh, was, is a good design for a skilled nursing facility. Uh, some people would say, well, if you had built two floors up and had a square <laughs> building, you could have fit more people. Mm -hmm. But actually, functionally, especially <clears throat> for the, the ways our community has used the building and families being able to you know, walk freely from one part to another, uh, it's, it's really worked. Yeah, the design has really worked. So, uh, Brian, you want to talk about uh, the uh, nursing home advising board that was formed? Um, well, so that, you know, ACC had an idea, a concept of what the building would be physically, but what do we want in the building? So, the, um, in uh, January 1984, ACC formed a nursing home advisory board, uh, and Bob Garrett. Uh, who was uh, from the Florin United Methodist Church, uh, served as the first chairperson. Uh, then he was succeeded by Art Imaguri, Gloria's husband. <laughs> you knew that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the advisory board uh, allowed the community members to uh, offer their ideas, uh, opinions about the nursing home project, and uh, even presenters, ex so-called uh, subject matter experts in the community were uh, invited to come talk to the community. Uh, these uh, experts included uh, Ray G. Uh, back then, he was a consultant on loan from Escaton, and uh, Herb Nia, the architect for the nursing home design that ACC was uh, looking at seriously. So, um so, Gloria, do you remember like how this, how the Donna, how this board functioned? Well, you weren't here, Donna, but do you remember how this board functions? <laughs> Not yet. My memory is shot. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know Art was that. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go and ask. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I really can't. How the board that that okay. committee functioned mm -hmm. or the advisory board? Well. I do remember we had people like uh, Deanna Bellantac, you know, she was on the faculty of Sac, Sac State. They worked on the, was it the policy and procedure manuals and this and that. Mm -hmm. And I know Sharon Yang was our dietary uh, consultant. I don't know mm -hmm. where they got her, but she's the one that designed that kitchen. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. that, that, so, that so I, th I think the board did a lot of outreach for uh, two experts to anybody, especially people in the community who also knew something about skilled nursing care, getting licensed, how to build a building that would be licensed mm -hmm. uh, by the state and the health department. Um, and I think there was a huge amount of work uh, that Bob Matsui, Chui Ito, several of the leaders uh, did uh, sort of on their own time when they were in meetings, uh, talking to people, uh, finding names, getting referrals. Mm -hmm. Certainly this design that was chosen for the nursing home was one of many that was considered. Um, even later on, we'll talk about the financing. Uh, there was lots of discussions and I'm sure contact with different people who could help with the financing to understand it how to get through the state regulatory and review processes. Mm -hmm. um, Oshpod, in those days, they had a CON, uh, which you had to get permission from the state 
to even consider developing a nursing home. Not yeah, anybody yeah. could just go to the state and say, I want to build a nursing home. Mm -hmm. They had this whole thing about the number of beds, the number of people serve uh, per nursing mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to overpopulate some areas uh, with a lot of nursing homes and have empty beds. Um, and then, of course, the Medi-Cal people were concerned about whether or not there would be enough beds for very low-income people. And, and in those years, also, there was the struggle back and forth on um, how you would develop regulations uh, so that people who were very low-income could have a fair chance at getting the care they needed, uh, even if the state was paying for their care. Because in those days, there were a lot of facilities that just wanted to serve private pay yeah. people. Yeah. And also in those days, in the early days, um, that was the start when everybody thought Medicare paid for everything, which it doesn't. It doesn't. <laughs> uh, so I think this whole idea, if we think about uh, everyday people uh, from our community who saw the need because of their family experiences and their friends, they went to places uh, that were serving, uh, that were providing care, and they saw how much needed to be done, um, that there was just a lot of work. I mean, I could see how a lot of people would, you know, uh, after a couple months say, oh, this is, this is too big of a project for us. <laughs> yeah. You know, we need somebody else who's a bunch of experts to do it. But I think one of the great stories about ACC is that people just rolled up their sleeves and said, no, let's bring the experts in. Let's learn how to do this. Let's consider all of the options. Uh, let's um, you know, not go to only friends and relatives, but let's look at the big picture. Uh, let's make sure we understand the political and the regulatory mm -hmm. environment. And that's where really having people who were involved in public policy was very important. So this, this this might have started as a sort of a homespun idea <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, because people were sharing their, part, their, their experiences and their doubts about how, how elders could get care. But I think it really grew into really a great partnership of a lot of different people in the community who may not have uh, even known each other on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, really, I think that rings true in terms of how all this came together. But uh, Brian, you want to comment that, you know, the nursing, there was a nursing home executive committee was formed and you were a part of it? Yeah, uh, guilty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, you know, while a few minutes ago we were kind of vague on what happened during the, um, the advisory board that met, something happened because it led to uh, ACC in, in December later in 1984 uh, determining that we want to, they wanted to establish the nursing home home, nursing home executive committee. And um, I think there's, uh, the uh, audience can see that the list of uh, uh, people who were on that board and on that board uh, or that exec committee were people like uh, Gloria <laughs> and uh, Winston Ashizawa, who could not be here today, and, and myself. But uh, there were other people on that board. A lot of a lot of great names on there. I think if you could look through it, um, a lot of names that we are familiar with, and I think people would be surprised by looking at that the list of who was on there. Because when we start doing this research, we start seeing these names and. I think they're unsung heroes who just behind the scenes, we didn't know they were really instrumental in helping us get get started. Yeah, well, um, I, you know, I, I was more or less a, a newbie to the Sacramento community, but uh, Chewy introduced many of uh, those uh, leaders to this uh, committee. Uh, and they were the leaders of uh, both the Chinese and Japanese community. Unfortunately, um, many of them have already passed yes. on. But you were in a with, uh, meeting with an elite group. I, I was. I was awed and humbled. <laughs> well, thank you for joining, Brian. So um, we can't overlook, you know, who was on the board. And many people um, have talked and commented 
on um, who was chosen. They were carefully chosen, and it was a balanced board. And you know, when we looked at those images, uh, we really, uh, I think it's an elite group of people that were on the board. Uh, but now, we're going to um, switch over to financial developments. And uh, before we get started, you know, Donna, um, you know, we worked a lot. You worked a lot with Escaton and Ray G, who uh, was a consultant and um, worked for ACC. So you want to talk about that? Well, I think um, when when ACC first started talking about doing a skilled nursing facility, I'm I can imagine the people in state government sitting in their offices saying these people haven't the faintest idea, and so they basically said, "Okay, if you guys really want to go forward with this, you better find somebody who's an expert." to really coach you and help you along. And I think ACC was very fortunate uh, to uh, approach Escaton and have Escaton, which is the other, a, a large nonprofit moving um, from hospital care to nursing home care, um, loaned us Ray G. And Ray had, uh, over his years at Escaton, had many, many different roles. Uh, and, and maybe one of the roles that we think about uh, uh, him having the most is uh, that he was involved with finances and knew over the years working with Escaton how different, how housing projects got financed, what the corporation had to do, what the board had to do. He knew something about nursing homes, how they got set up financially, how their financials had to look different. They were audited in a different way. Uh, the, the reimbursements from government insurance programs like Medicare and Medi-Cal uh, were totally different. That was totally different than doing mm -hmm. senior housing. Um, and so it was um, the breadth of Ray G's knowledge that I think really helped the board to understand uh, how it was getting into a very complicated and highly regulated business, uh, but also uh, how it was possible uh, if you got the right people, got the right experts. And um, so for instance, uh, only people really involved in developing property uh, or uh, working for the government would understand about bonds being issued. And, and, and so, you know, California, not every state, but California has a program uh, that basically insures bonds. So, you know, when you fund something with bonds, that's a debt financing, right? Uh, so bonds are sold and we invest in them and we get Right, many of us have bonds if we have any stocks mm -hmm. or investments or our IRA, and many of them are uh, publicly insured. And that means if something should happen that the bond cannot be paid off, or if, for instance, the bond funding for the nursing home should be in jeopardy because the nursing home wasn't doing well, the state would step in mm -hmm. and they would insure the rest of the debt um, mm -hmm. so that all the bondholders would get paid off. Now, the other thing that happens is that you get a long-term relationship with the state. Yeah. And at any time, they could put their arm in and shake you and tell you, <laughs> you need to do better. Um, so there are things like that that had to be explained. And I'm sure there were a lot of people who said, well, why can't we do it without the government? You know, why do we have to allow the government to do all of these things? And then I'm sure there were other people on the board who said, oh, this is good because we'll never go too far off the rails. <laughs> yeah. You know, the government yeah. will yeah. also save us from ourselves. <laughs> so I think ACC uh, really grew up in that environment of back and forth, uh, partnering with the government and learning about all these things like what do banks do? Mm -hmm. So of course, when the, when the state insures a bond, they're like, well, we don't want to be the only ones that's on the hook. So they said, you have to get a share. And ACC, which was a group of volunteers, mm -hmm. right, many of whom 
were hardly even getting paid, or they were taking care of their families and starting their businesses like Jimmy or like Chewy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when they said, well, you have to raise some money, it meant that the ACC board had to go to banks. They had to go to commercial banks with no collateral. Yeah. And so that's a whole nother story yeah, yeah. of another hero. Yeah. And I, I think we wanted and, to talk about that And next. we'll hear about that. And I just remember when I came on the board and would sit and listen to Ray's financial updates, I would just be in awe of how he could just look at the numbers. He could look at a spreadsheet and say, you know, and just point out and have that discussion. So we're really fortunate to have Ray G uh, with us. But uh, we're going to talk about um, to build the nursing home, it required securing financing that Donna talked about, a bond, and raising money. And so in this next video clip, Winston Ashizawa explains the first step in getting the nursing home financed. Through Chewy's uh, Ito's direction, we got involved with uh, John Dowdell and Gary Hicks, who were uh, uh, financial experts in uh, housing projects. And uh, they uh, were instrumental in helping us get uh, the uh, funds to uh, begin the, the planning and development of the ACC nursing home. So around 1982, Chewy Ito was busy recruiting new board members, bringing on influential people, and shaping the operating culture of ACC to raise funds. So let's hear Winston continue to tell the story. You know, I think it's uh, appropriate to say that the Chinese and Japanese cultures both provide a lot of respect and support for seniors. And, um, and so uh, across uh, those two communities, it became a strong uh, base for uh, uh, appealing for support, financial help uh, in our fundraising. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing the extent to which um, uh, Chewy and his gas station on Riverside Boulevard uh, was uh, uh, a key uh, element and he was a key leader in terms of his vast uh, sense of community connection. We were able to get uh, membership uh, on the new board uh, that reflected um, this uh, uh, multicultural approach. And I think, you know, Sacramento was unique in that, uh, and you look at other cities, Seattle and Los Angeles, et cetera, uh, that were successful in establishing uh, nursing homes for uh, Asians, they, they were largely done by uh, uh, one culture. So there were Japanese care homes and there were Chinese care homes, perhaps a few. Chewy was able to uh, get a broad cross-section of people, whether they were in um, uh, the grocery business or uh, healthcare or uh, involved in, uh, at some point, you know, the uh, 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 drum and bugle corps. Um, when we started Bingo, you know, we had a, a number of uh, Asian organizations running Bingo and Bingo was a key element to providing uh, revenue for uh, ACC and the nursing home. So in 1983, developer Angelus Lakopoulos made ACC history and secured its future with a generous donation of land for the nursing home. Let's hear Jimmy Yee's reaction to it. You, you mentioned that there was, uh, when we were talking before a little bit, um, that there was this a major catalyst, that was your word, a catalyst that, that made, um, that really moved this group, this informal group forward. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, I looked at it as a major catalyst and anytime you have an idea and try to sell it to the public, you need something to show them from what I look back at. 
and what can you show them except something on paper? That, yeah. that doesn't prove that you're going to do it. Angelo, donating land, land, in my mind, was the major catalyst in getting this project moving. Mm -hmm. That wasn't the only thing, but it was the start. And I'm glad he did because now we could go out and talk to our public and say, here's what we got, but we need more. Mm -hmm. And listening to the story about why we need it, it wasn't too hard to sell, sell the project. People know that we need it mm -hmm. and we need financing. So that was an interview where Judy Keene and uh, Donnie Yee were talking with uh, Jimmy and Phil. And I have to give a shout out to Judy because she, she sees Jimmy almost every day walking and they chit chat and come up. And so she got us to get Jimmy to come in and do the interview. So thank you to Judy. So um, as you know, there was another hurdle for ACC that Angelo's donation, donation overcame. So ACC finally had the collateral, which was the land that was required for the bond financing. And here's Winston explaining this. Would you say that the donation of the land was maybe the highlight of that whole development process or the main catalyst? Oh yes, definitely. Because um, the bond sources wanted to know that there was um, uh, assets already involved that uh, wouldn't come out of the bond proceeds. So having the property uh, was really, really important. And um, uh, Angelo Tsikopoulos donated, I think, uh, uh, two acres. Well, uh, so he, the first donation was, was uh, two acres, but uh, uh, when we had the architectural uh, examination and of uh, what could be done, we found the site too small in order to build a 99 bed uh, care facility. So Chuyi went back to Angelo and asked him to consider uh, gifting us both enough land so that we could uh, develop the project on the site. And Angelo uh, made that uh, a secondary gift, which made it all possible. Because then we could say, well, we have a site and we have uh, ownership control of the site to the bonding authorities. And uh, so that, that was really a, a big factor. So in listening to, to Winston, who actually approached Angela Sakopoulos for the land donation? We're not scheduled to interview Angela until next month. So we'll have to go with Jimmy Yee's story right now. Uh, but before we do, uh, let's have Donna explain the relationship between uh, Chewy, Ito, and Robert Matsui, who is a key supporter for ACC. Uh, he served on the city, Bob served on the city council from 1971 to 1978. Then he served in Congress representing Sacramento from 1979 to 2005. And this is really a critical part of the story of, of Bob and Chewy. I, you know, I can, I imagine Chewy at the gas station. <laughs> Chewy, Chewy never sat down for very long. I imagine him constantly walking around. I, I imagine that uh, Bob would come in to get gas and they would start talking. And then at some point, Chewy would say, oh, why don't you come to my office? And a lot of us know that his office was across the street. He had a booth at Vic's Ice Cream. <laughs> and he sort of, uh, he didn't hold court, but he had a lot of serious meetings there over coffee. Uh, and I just imagine that with the frequency of their contact, uh, they had a lot of discussions over different ways uh, to really overcome the hurdles mm -hmm. and different people to be contacted. Uh, so, you know, in the everyday world, if you come up with some names and it takes a few days, sometimes a week, I can't reach them. They haven't answered my phone. So I sort of imagine uh, like a day-to-day -day dialogue uh, between Chewy and Bob just coming up with the package, mm -hmm. contacting all these different people, uh, talking about who else uh, could come in on the deal, who else should be approached, whether Bob should approach them, uh, whether Chewy should approach them, who else they should get involved with. So I think, um, 
you know, this kind of informal, I think uh, Jimmy mentioned it earlier in the video, you know, he doesn't remember going to too many meetings because I think uh, in our community, especially in this instance, uh, a lot was done by people walking around, standing, having coffee, uh, talking. I think Chewy was the one who sort of carried uh, the, the, the agenda and uh, kept track of uh, how far we were going and when we were ready to do the next thing. Okay, so we're gonna play another video of, um, of Jimmy. So what were some of those first steps that this informal group took to, that led towards the, the beginnings of the nursing home and ACC? The, the way I look back at it is uh, I have to pinpoint it right down to Bob Matsui. You know, when you're in politics, you get to meet a lot of people, a lot of business people, a lot of developers. Uh -huh. And fortunately, uh, Bob Matsui had the opportunity to meet with Angelo Sakopoulos. Oh. Angelo is one of those big time donors to the Greek community. Uh -huh. But he didn't think only of the Greek community because when Bob went to talk to him, I wasn't in on the discussion with, between Bob and Angelo, but uh -huh. I assumed that during the discussions that it went from what started out as a housing project into a nursing home. Oh. That's wow. how I looked at it. But because Bob eventually stepped away from the council and moved on to the assembly, right. uh, he was in and out of Sacramento so much, Chewy became a big part of the, the coordination. Because uh -huh. he knew all the background, he knew the Japanese community, and he threw some of us get to know the Chinese community better. And so I have to hand it to Chewy to pick up the glove and move on to where we're at today. So next, we're going to hear from Phil Eisenberg, who was Sacramento's mayor during ACC's formative years from 1975 to 1982. So Phil will talk more about Angelo's role, the location of ACC in the pocket area, fundraising, and the immense support ACC got from Isla Collins, who served on the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors all through the nursing home construction and two day, decades and beyond. So let's listen in to Phil talking. But my impression was when Angelo made his decision, let's say he donated land, contributed cash, it was all part of the pocket. And the pocket area, this area we're in today, uh, before World War II was farmed largely Right. by Greek Americans and by Japanese American farmers. Oh. And Angelo had a really uh, strong nostalgic identification with the pocket. He was also developing the hell out of it. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, and, and the merger of interest of land developers with, with charitable activities comes because if you allow and permit and encourage uh, nonprofit and charitable activities as part of a land development, public officials tend to look at, upon that as a really big benefit, uh -huh. making uh, not easy, but easier uh -huh. the uh, processing of applications for residential housing and shopping centers and all the stuff that's in the pocket. Uh -huh. You made me feel like you talk about me because that's exactly how I felt. You know, when the yeah. developer comes in, he has a larger piece of property, uh -huh. but he wants to donate land for a charitable. It makes it easier for us to make that mm -hmm. decision because it isn't only for money with him, but he's spending money for the community. Right. Yeah. So now we're going to hear Phil talk about the uh, great support that we got from Isla Collins. You know, when you reach out <laughs> to your friends, they and their parents belong to all different organization right. so uh -huh. it's not just reaching your friends but their friends organization okay. it, it's, yeah, it yeah, just opens up to a whole broad spectrum of uh -huh. who those donors could be uh -huh. yeah and you know, although there's always competition for raising money you go to the Buddhist church downtown you go to the right. foreign uh, church you go to the uh, JACL you go you go to where there are established connections yeah. right yes that and those connections eventually lead to 
hopefully meetings, small meetings, one-on-one, -on -one, that's yeah. Jimmy's specialty, but also small events. Yes. And I, I don't know, I can't remember all the events I attended as mayor, but I think I did 500 events one year <laughs> uh, when I was young yeah. and really crazy. And a couple of those were probably fundraisers for, if not ACC, for some version of ACC. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. in, in ACC's experience, it was really about going to individuals in the yes. community. Yeah. The project resonated with those people and the support sort of swelled up. It's a really mm. different model. I, I'd argue to you that if you were looking for seminal points along the path, the interest of, of Isla Collin in oh, right. ACC and Asian American stuff generally, for that almost 20 year period when she was on the board of supervisors, she would do endless little things to help. She'd be at every single event always, but she carried the message. She must have bothered other supervisors about uh, <laughs> things like this. And that was a tool that you got from a single individual who committed her time and her interest mm -hmm, right. to further development of the project. That's a big deal. So wasn't that great hearing Phil talk? And so we really want to thank uh, Phil and his wife, Marilyn, for their long-term support for ACC. They've been big supporters of ACC. I've seen them at many of our events over the years. So thank you, Phil and Marilyn, for your support. So with that, uh, the land donation in 1983 became a landmark year for ACC and fundraising. So talking about fundraising, ACC Bingo opened mm -hmm. in 1983, which we will cover in next month's episode on December 20th, and Francis Lee volunteered to serve as the general manager for ACC Bingo. So Francis learned how to run bingo for ACC. She got all the volunteers. She ran, ran the bingo session and raised money for ACC. And we'll cover all these points in the next episode, the story of ACC Bingo. You'll have to join in and go down memory lane with all of us and maybe a few games of virtual bingo. We'll see how we pull that off, Ted. Um, so that first year in 1983, in five months from August to December, bingo raised $42,000, which in today's dollars is $116,000. That was a lot of money back then. And so to, if you have any comments, um, Please let us know, post them, and we can uh, share them with us. But you know, we really want to give a shout out to Francis Lee for all that work for Bingo. And you talk about ACC and Bingo, and people get excited. They really get excited. Um, so now we're going to go on to ACC had an East Meets West fashion show organized by Helen Kwong that raised $2,500. And according to the ACC News, Molly Kimura and Maylee Tom coordinated models in a rich display of historical costumes and ultra-modern fashion. And Denise Matsunaga, who's the owner of the store Madame Butterfly in the Pavilions, provided the ultra-modern fashions. So let's listen to what Helen said about the fashion show. Uh, but anyway, what we had was a fashion show. And I was so excited, I called it East meets west and uh, from the east came uh, Mabel Tom who is our great May Lee Tom's mother-in-law lovely lovely lady she had all kinds of beautiful clothes and she loaned it to us anyway then after showing the Chinese gowns and we had the Japanese outfits, it was really beautiful. The gals would, uh, would, would have their clothes and show it. And, and when they got through and they were walking down the runway, we had some handsome men, handsome men. Like, I remember Roger Fong, Jimmy Yi, Ralph Sugimoto, and quite a few of the fellows that were waiting for the models to walk down the ramp. And then they would hand them a red rose. And after that, they were uh, escorted around the whole uh, place and showed everybody the clothes up close and all. So we had a wonderful time. And it was another evening to remember. 
Well, that sounded like a lot of fun, that fashion show and seeing all the high fashion and, you know, maybe we should do another one. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Get some handsome men to walk the young ladies down the aisle. But anyway, so back down, also in 1983, Henry Takeda and Dr. William Fong were selected as co-chairs for the nursing home capital campaign. Their goal was to raise $250,000, which is around $675,000 in today's dollars. So Jimmy Yi, Margaret Lim, and Toko Fuji became the day-to-day -day fund drive leaders, organizing more than 200 volunteers to canvass the community. So does did anybody remember any of that? Those fund drives? Mm -hmm. and We're always raising money. We always set goals. And so those are pretty ambitious goals back then. But uh, again, um, this is what ACC was all about. So next, we're going to show an image of here we see two auctioneers, Stuart Sato, who has hosted, helped host our Big Day of Giving, and Phil Eisenberg auctioning, auctioning off art. So they look like they're very engaged in getting bids. They've got their fingers pointed out. Someone must have made a bid and accepting that for ACC. So we're very excited to see you know, Phil and Stuart, who are well known in the community, helping ACC out. So next, and we're going to have another clip about Jimmy Yee. He's talking about what it was like to ask people for money. Between Chu and I, we talked about how to go out and raise money. In order to ask people for money, you have to be upfront yourself. How much are you going to put in? Right. So just between Chu and I, we agreed to put up $2,500 at that time. Wow. You know, it's a lot of money now, but back then it was huge. Yeah. And so with that as an incentive, whenever we went, or whenever I went out to raise money, they would ask how much would you put in? That was something that I could go back on and yeah. they could either put more or even less, either way. Uh -huh. But it was a talking point. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. So when, when Jimmy talked about, you know, if you're going to ask people for money, you got to say that you put money down and really thankful for uh, Chewy and, and, and Jimmy putting out that first mo money out there for everybody. So everything was going really well for ACC, except for we had one major financial hurdle to overcome. And it's not clear to the average person uh, that anybody knew about it, but one person did, and that was Victor Yee, the Senior Vice President at Sacramento Savings and Loan. And we spoke to him a few weeks ago, and here's what he had to say. How did you get started in the early discussions? It was only because I filled my gas tank at Chewy's gas station. Oh, okay. that Chewy and I started talking back in about 1983, 84. Mm -hmm. And when time I stopped there and he says we're short two and a half two point one million dollars to let the bonds get released so the nursing home can get started with construction and we've talked to several banks and they can't help us I didn't think you could I said let's have a meeting so I get I'll get back to Chewy I told him I get back to him mm -hmm. went back to the bank talked to the president of the bank Bill Hay Mm -hmm. Let's hold a meeting in the conference room and see who you can get to attend. Okay. And back to see Chewy. He says, good. So he attended with Toko Fuji, oh. Gary Hicks, myself, and officials from three other banks locally that had heard the story before. And they were willing to hear the story again in the Sacramento Savings Conference Room. So we had a meeting. We all heard the story. From Chewy, from Chewy and, and Gary Hicks and the 2.1 million, Sacramento Savings says we can do the 2.1 million letter of credit so your bonds can be released, or we'll take 25 percent, whatever you choose. And he excused himself and left, and came back. We did the whole 2.1 million letter, and the bonds were released, and ultimately the nursing home was started construction and completed. So what was it like talking with Chewy and working with him? Oh, he was always very interesting and in doing something good for this community to have an Asian base at least started that way mm -hmm. for a nursing home, something we needed in this community. Oh. So we were, 
we were glad to be involved at Sacramento Savings. So that was Victor Yi, and, and I've known Victor for quite a long time, but I never knew he was involved in getting the bond, fi the financing for ACC to secure the bond. And then, Victor's very modest, he never talks about it like a lot of people, but uh, we really thank Victor and Sacramento Savings for stepping up and securing the financing for us. And you know, as we know at ACC, we draw people in and Victor joined ACC's finance committee and we use his knowledge for our benefit. But the, it, Victor didn't stop there. He even held his own ACC uh, fundraiser for ACC and two other groups. And so we'll hear Victor talk about this. I reflect back into 1984, where our daughter, son, Sherry and I, we were in Hawaii and we saw the Kush crush, crush in 1983 <laughs> in yes. on Big Island. Yeah. <laughs> and then our daughter says, why don't we get them to come to Sacramento? I said, you write the letter, I'll sign it. Oh, she wrote the letter. She wrote the letter. And signed it and sent it to them in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh huh. And they said they'd be coming to San Francisco in the Bay Area to perform. We said, why don't you do a day in Sacramento? They did two concerts, August 4th, 1984, and the beneficiaries would be Raymar's Mandarin Drum and Bugle Corps, okay. Big Brothers and Big Sisters, and the Asian Community Nursing Home. So At ten dollars a person, we raised over four thousand dollars, and we divided that among the three. Oh, this when, what do you have in your hand? This is the poster from the Crush, back in 1984, where they performed at the Confucius Temple for ten dollars a person, and we were able to do two shows that night. Wow! So, how many people remember Crush back yeah. in the day? <laughs> I remember Crush, but I don't remember going there or hearing <laughs> that they were coming. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people would listen to their music, and, and if you went to vacation in Hawaii, you went and got a ticket to see Crush. So thank you, Victor, for organizing, Dina, his daughter Dina, for organizing that, uh, that and having a really, really a good time. <laughs> so moving on, on August 22nd, 1985, the California Health Facilities Authority approved the $3.8 million bond issuance for the Asian Community Nursing Home a 30-year fixed rate at nine and a quarter percent. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. Nine, four. nine and a quarter percent is like, wow. You know, you're talking about so. Uh, so now we're going to see articles from the ACC News and photos on the groundbreaking and grand opening of the nursing home. So their photos are, are being put up. And there are just different ones, mm -hmm. and uh, of the groundbreaking. You have uh, articles of when it opened. Uh, you're going to see uh, photos of people actually there. We've got dignitaries there. We've got board members there. Uh, Chewy's there. Isla Collins. Um, just a lot of people. And uh, we had like the construction manager, uh, Sightman, which is Ben Yokozumo. No, Yokomizu. Yokomizu. Zo. Mizo. 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 That was a new name that I had not heard of yeah. uh, until we started having these meetings and we started talking about all the people that were involved. And the list goes on and on, but you can see where uh, the ground was being, the groundbreaking, uh, the bare land, and then you see the siding starting to go up. There's different photos of people walking through the, uh, the, uh, the halls the, with the walls starting, starting to just go up. But, uh, really amazing to see, you know, what it would look like being built, and then you go back and you see it today, and, and we're almost done with replacing the siding. <laughs> From you look at these pictures now, we just finished replacing the siding. Um, we're almost done by, I think, end of the December we'll be done with that project. But, again, a lot of great photos. Any, you guys want to comment about any of those? I, I think one of the things that a lot of people will remember is uh, how many volunteers help with the landscaping. Mm -hmm. So while there was a landscape archi uh, architect, uh, they needed lots of help just putting in the, the pieces, the preparing the, the property, you know, the, mm -hmm. the land, all of those things. So I think that even uh, while construction was going, there must have been a huge recruitment of volunteers to help with the building, but also, like Gloria was talking about, 
uh, to help get ready for uh, operations and opening. Because even in those days, you had to be ready to admit your first person in order for licensing to come. They wouldn't give you a license and then you open a week later. Uh, you basically had to have everything all set. You had to have your staff on board, the schedules for every staff person. You had to have policies and procedures. So there was an enormous amount of work while the construction was going on and while they were going back and forth with licensing and with Oshpon. Yeah, I was reading through some of the articles, and when they broke ground, they started a waiting list. And uh, it consisted of people that were already in uh, nursing homes, people that um, uh, think they might have needed care, and so and people that really needed care that weren't in a nursing home yet. And so they already had started a wait list of, uh, for the 99 beds, so that was really, really good. Um, another thing, though, is uh, I don't, we, we haven't shown, um, Brian, you were there at the, at the groundbreaking? Um, I believe I was there at the brown, <laughs> but, groundbreaking. But, but Brian, well, Brian brought a t-shirt. I don't, we haven't had a chance to show it yeah, yet. Yeah, well, actually, uh, the t-shirt I'm going to show you was a um, commemorative uh, souvenir uh, at the grand opening. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, let's see it. Let's, let's see it, Brian. <laughs> Oops, upside down. Upside down. <laughs> so, that this uh, has the uh, the uh, the former ACC logo. The original logo. Original, original yeah. Logo. Who designed the logo? Do you Ron know? Hitomi, I think. Yeah. What's that again? Ron Hitomi. Hitomi. Ron Hitomi. He was yeah. a graphic artist. Mm. Yeah. So some of you old timers who oh, may be see. watching this. Uh, <laughs> Still may have your T-shirt. I know James Chu does has one. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Brian, for bringing that. So, uh, final thoughts from the panelists um, today on on what we talked about. Boy, we covered a lot of uh, <laughs> material, mm -hmm. and we're hardly even open. We're we're not even to the first day of opening. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's a big story. It's a yeah, big story. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, well, I'm, I found this to be a very uh, informative uh, experience for me because even though there was evidence that I was <laughs> part of the development nursing home, a lot of information has been brought up that uh, refreshed some memories and some of this information was new to me. <laughs> but it, it's very interesting to see how it all evolved. I mean, you think you attend the, uh, the committee meetings and you learn about what's going on. But 90% happens, as we know from uh, today's presentation, 90% is behind the, scenes. Behind yes. the doors, behind the curtains. And that's what, how su success comes about. Yeah. A lot of those informal meetings, mm -hmm. right? Coffee, ice cream. <laughs> yes, right. Coffee and ice cream. So, um, so we are going to have part two of the nursing home the early years of operation in March of next year. So if you have any stories or photos or know people we should interview, contact Ted Fong at tfong at accsv.org. And so with that, I want to thank our great panelists today. They brought a lot of input and knowledge, uh, Donna, Brian, Gloria, and May. And I want to thank Ted Fong, who actually did all the research uh, for the story of the nursing home, going through all the past newsletters, finding the people and actually helping record the interviews. We couldn't have done that uh, without Ted and really writing, writing this all down for us to talk about. And so we all learned a lot. Yes. And so we all learned a lot from these interviews. And also we have a list of all the founders of ACC back, back then where people who contributed into their money, time, and equity. And so these are, it's scrolling on the bottom, and this is a list of everybody who was really wow. instrumental in getting ACC started. And really, uh, you might find that same na list name at the, uh, the, the care center, the nursing home. And so this is where we want to really acknowledge all the people who helped ACC get to where we are today. And we wouldn't be here without the generous support of all these, these founders uh, back then when we got started. So again, we can't thank these founders and your families, again, for all that support.
And so I learned a lot today. As we do these history projects, I learn more and more about ACC, and this is our effort to document the history of ACC. So thank you for joining us this afternoon. We hope you had as much time, good time as we did. So thank you so much.